I'm going to get started. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, is Ethan here? It doesn't look like it. That's okay. I'll just go ahead and get started. He can join us when he's ready. Um, so welcome, everyone, to the How Good Innovation Online series. Um, my name is Leah Wolf. I'm the head of regenerative education and content here at How Good. Um, and we are kicking off our next uh, round of innovation series talks, conversations with thought leaders. Um, we've been doing them for a little over a year now. Um, and I was able to attend a couple of them before I started with How Good. So I'm so excited to be involved now. It's, uh, you know, dreams really do come true. Um, and so we're going to focus on regenerative supply and specifically how we can scale up ingredients and innovate in a way that doesn't compromise the integrity of our regenerative goals and, and ideals. Um, so I'm so excited for our lineup of truly brilliant and engaging speakers throughout the series. And we're kicking it off today with a group that is um, all that and more uh, as we focus on regenerative dairy across markets. Um, and so I am very pleased to introduce uh, Amber Mirabal, who is the director of UMW Core Services in Dairy 2025 at Lando Lakes. Um, Anne Saxelby, who is the founder of Saxelby Cheesemongers. Um, and Tina Owens, who is the Senior Director of Food and Agriculture Impact at Danone North America. And so a quick uh, agenda for you all to give an idea of what we'll be uh, talking about today. Um, we'll have a panel discussion with our thought leaders for about 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, and then we are going to do a community discussion in breakout rooms. Um, and then following that, we'll have the opportunity for some audience Q&A with our speakers. Uh, just to give you <clears throat> a little sneak preview of our upcoming events, um, we're so excited for all of the amazing speakers that we have lined up. On August 26th, we're going to be talking about the future of plant-based supply with Lisa Curtis from Cooley Cooley, Naveen Sika from Terviva, and Tyler Lorenzen from Puris. And then on September 9th, we'll be talking with James Lum from Defiant Food and uh, from Alex Piasecki from Seal the Seasons about how, um, how we can use novel ideas to enable a resilient regenerative supply system. And so I hope that you all can join us for uh, one or all of our sessions. Um, and you can sign up for those at howgood.com slash innovation series. And so with that, I would love to get our panel discussion started. Um, and the first thing that I'd like to ask all of our panel members um, is if there's a, a dairy product that you just can't get enough of right now. Um, and that is if you're not totally sick of, of eating dairy at this point. Um, Anne, why don't we start with you if you can think of, of something off the top of your head? Oh, of course. Well, I mean, I would be remiss if I didn't say cheese um, because that's uh, pretty much all I do. Uh, so yeah, cheese all the time, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I have currently a wedge of Montgomery's cheddar, which is a really fun cheddar that I picked up from a friend of mine uh, last weekend. So that's my dairy snack of choice today. Love that. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, I'll say cheese too, um, not just because Anne's on the call, but because it's true. My husband literally said last night, in our next house, I think we need a beverage fridge and a cheese fridge because you're filling the fridge too much. It's taking, the cheese is taking up too much space in a regular fridge. So it's definitely cheese for me too. I love doing cheese boards, like when we host and stuff like that. So I like having all different kinds. And for me, it would be uh, organic, organic cottage cheese. So a little bit of a variant there in the cheese theme, but still in the right vein. Amazing. I was just introduced to a cottage cheese and a baked potato, which I had never done before. It's a real game changer. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, to get into, you know, the meat of our, of our panel discussion a little bit more, um, I'd like to ask, so the American dairy industry has been, has been struggling for some time. Uh, we have consolidation and artificially low prices and labor issues, um, you know, the carbon intensity of production. And so in your opinion, what needs to be addressed first to move toward a more sustainable model? Um, and why don't, uh, Tina, why don't uh, you take this question first and then Amber and Anne, you can jump in. 
Yeah, thanks, Leah. I appreciate the question. Um, so one of the ways that we um, believe that we can drive for true change within the system is actually to take away the commodification of uh, items that come off the farm. So rather than purchasing from a large black box, actually moving to direct uh, sourcing contracts with your dairy suppliers. And this is something that Deno North America has been um, extremely vigilant in doing. So starting a few years ago, we moved away from one of the largest co-op models into a direct sourcing model. And we have over 600 family farms that we're sourcing from um, through individual contracts with those farms. Uh, a lot of those are on our Horizon Organic Dairy brand. Um, but a lot of them are on our non-GMO project verified and conventional milk as well. And so those uh, contracts typically are one to two years. And so it gives the farmer, uh, you know, the ability to look out a little further than what they might on the commoditized market. But then separately, we went beyond that and created what's called a cost plus model program, which is the cost of production plus a margin. Now, that is fundamentally different from the way the current dairy industry works because um, the cost of dairy for a few years running now has not even covered the cost of production. And so farmers have been subsidizing the low prices in the dairy industry through a loss of their own equity um, on, on farm value and subsidizing it by debt, which is why, you know, Sonny Perdue before he left the USDA stated that we were at the highest debt levels uh, for farms since the 1980s. And so it's the inverse relation of what prices are that are covering the cost and the needs at the farms. So the cost plus model program is, um, with uh, specific farmers that supply significant volumes that are strategic for Denome, but the contracts are typically five years or longer. And so that allows the farmers to get out of this next quarter, next year, next, um, next year gener uh, discussion and, and get into a next decade and next generation discussion. And it allows them to look deeper at how their own activities can impact greenhouse gas emissions and um, move more towards a regenerative model. And you mentioned carbon intensity, Leah, I'd be remiss if I uh, didn't say that How Good's tool is helping us with measuring what our carbon intensity is for some of our products in-house as well. But those, the direct source contracting and measurement um, and the relationships with farms is really uh, our strongest aspect that we would talk about in relation to fighting low prices in dairy. Thank you so much. Yeah, and and those those long term contracts is something that. So my background is that I was a, a butcher for five years, and so one of the one of our main sources was a co op model, and it worked very well for them to have these longer term contracts where farmers and suppliers could make more of a commitment to these regenerative practices um, without the the fear of of you know it not working the way that they, you know, are used to and potentially losing some of that, that income. Um, and I know that Amber Lando Lakes is a co-op. And so I wonder if you could speak a little bit to, to this question and, and kind of how, what, how Lando Lakes looks at this. Sure. Yeah. So just speaking from um, the tough time in the dairy industry, it is very tough for farmers right now. And now we're experiencing this big drought and there's still so much milk in the market. So prices are still very low. So unfortunately, um, I don't think it's going to stop being tough for a little while. So our perspective from a co-op, we are a co-op. We have about 1,500 dairy members that supply milk to Land Lakes for our um, butter and cheese. And um, we really think it's a multi-pronged approach moving forward. So we think it's a combination of really good policy um, and making sure that um, sustainable agriculture is being supported and that dairy farmers are being supported. But then also you still have um, the supplier, so Lando Lakes, and you still have large customers like, you know, Danone and Nestle and all those people that we come together and join hand in hand to really make a, a good regenerative system. So we're, the farmers aren't going to be able to do it alone. The number one hurdle, honestly, is them ha being able to invest in sustainable technology. So figuring out through that multi-pronged approach that we can get the right sort of incentives in farmers' hands, but also how do we incentivize um, the, the commercial side of the business. So how do we make sure that these new sustainable technologies that are getting created, that not only those te technologies make that startup company money, but how do we make sure that it's, it's a technology that's installed on farm that gives the farmer um, a diversification source of income through that, because that's really what is going to incentivize them because the prices are so low. So just ensuring that, ensuring that we're all walking hand in hand to try to make those things happen. 
Amazing, thank you. Um, and do you have anything that you'd like to add as far as how you're, you know, I know that you are dealing less in, in liquid milk production and more in sort of cheese and value added products. And so, um, you know, how, what's your, what's your perspective working with a lot of these smaller producers? Yeah, well, value added dairy production, which is, um, you know, a farmer kind of um, handling everything on farm soup to nuts from Actually, not always. The farmer doesn't have to necessarily milk the animals um, and then make the product and sell the product. Some of our farms will actually buy milk um, from other farms and turn that into um, artisan cheese or butter or yogurt. But having the ability to control the end price of your product um, is really powerful. And, um, and that was um, a big impetus um, you know, for many farms to move towards artisan cheese making to begin with, especially if they were just getting started and they wanted to remain a small farm because it's very hard to be a small dairy of say, I don't know, 20 to 50 cows and participate in the commodity market just because um, like uh, Tina and Amber were saying, the commodity prices are set and, um, and they're often below the cost of production. So um, doing value added products is certainly a great um, option, although that's not what everybody wants to do. Some people are dairy farmers and that's what they wanna do because let's face it, that's a full-time job in and of itself let alone being a cheesemaker or yogurt maker, and then maybe even distributing that and, and marketing that yourself as well. But um, another interesting thing that I don't think has been discussed yet. So it seems like there are different ways to get at the pricing of commodity milk. One uh, could be to you know, change how much farmers are, are paid, but that's very difficult. That's policy, that's government, that's tariffs potentially, that's limiting production. Um, uh, something, you know, I think Canada, for example, does a better job at that than us. They really protect their dairy farmers through um, limiting production and putting higher tariffs on dairy products coming from other places. Uh, it doesn't seem like the U.S. is moving in that direction. So another option could be um, similar to um, what they do in Switzerland, where dairy farmers are actually kind of paid a subsidy from the government to be um, essentially stewards of the land and the environmental um, landscape because the Swiss landscape is part of what makes that country so amazing and interesting, um, both from an agricultural perspective, but also from a tourism perspective. And so if you can subsidize um, farmers as land stewards um, by giving them subsidies to improve, you know, water quality, um, you know, carbon um, capturing on the farm, um, that's another way to subsidize um, those farmers without going at it from kind of the, the tariff route. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and getting, you know, paying the farmers more is something that's really, really difficult, especially when we're dealing with so much surplus liquid milk, as well as these sort of artificially low, low prices. Um, so that kind of brings me into our uh, into a little bit more of a specific question um, about challenges that you face in your role, or if not in your role, then in, um, you know, roles of suppliers and procurement teams trying to work together to, to collaborate, to build this more regenerative supply. And so, you know, what are some of the challenges that you or, or your colleagues are facing um, right now? I guess I could jump. Oh, sorry, Amber, were you going to say something? Okay. No, you go first. I'll, I'll go okay. after you. Okay, cool. Um, I was going to say one of the challenges that we face um, is, is definitely scale in the artisan cheese industry because, um, you know, the cheesemakers that we work with, we work with about 40 small, uh, 40 to 50 small farms in uh, New England and also a handful in the Midwest. Um, and, and they are small. So right now, I think that the interest in and the demand for artisan cheese is probably um, in excess of what's able to be produced um, by a lot of the small producers that we work with. So um, being able to scale up the artisan cheese industry just slightly, so it's maybe not huge as huge as Nestle say, but you know somewhere in the middle ground, I think would do a lot to um, get consumers what they want because Americans are drinking less fluid milk, but they are they are wanting more dairy products like cheese, yogurt, butter, all these other things. So um, being able to get at artisan production in a slightly bigger scale. Um, another thing that we face as kind of a challenge is accessibility um, because, and again, this is related to scale, artisan cheese is typically um, more expensive than um, most supermarket cheese. And so it's about um, trying to get at how to um, make a really high quality product 
that does right by the farmers, that does right by the land, but also isn't going to cost $30 a pound at retail. So um, people can incorporate it into their daily lives like they do, say, in France or in other European countries. Amber, did you have something that you wanted to add? Oh, sure. Yeah, I was just going to say from our perspective in making progress, it's some things that I already mentioned. I mean, the, the real hurdle is being able to find um, economically feasible technologies that farmers can install and making sure that you have the right technology match. So um, farmers will tell you all day, every day that they're not going to install something that isn't gonna give them an ROI and rightfully so, they're running a business. So um, figuring out how to make that happen along with um, just the commercial availability to address issues like um, on-farm manure storage. I mean, yes, there's digesters, but a digester isn't fit for everybody. So what else is out there um, that can be brought to farmers that is more scalable than something as, for as a digester? So um, really finding the right technology match and ensuring that it fits the farm from a feasibility perspective, but also an economical perspective. Yeah, and I'll jump in there, Leah, and build on actually both Ann and Amber's points. So Ann talked about the consumer. And this is where I initially intended to head with this question, which is about creating resilient demand um, in order to have resilient supply. And so Ann talked about that connectivity with the consumer. Um, I lived this out in a past life at Kashi before I was at Danone, um, where you know we had a bespoke program that was helping farmers transition from conventional to organic practices. And within the natural and organic channel, we saw almost a double digit increase in one year in sales for the whole portfolio, because the value set of the brand was demonstrated in a new innovation and category that was brought to market that engaged both the customers like Whole Foods and others, but also the consumers, and then helped us scale change back in the supply. Now we're doing that now with our Horizon Organic brand, so our carbon positive uh, commitment by 2025 for um, st you know stem to stern on that brand that includes even you as the consumer with your refrigerator, uh, greenhouse gas emissions tied to you know the electricity for your own home. And um, we're just now bringing that story to our customers and to our consumers. And if you go and pull a Horizon uh, milk curtain off the, uh, the shelf, you'll see on the packaging that we're bringing that to life with consumers. So showing them that dairy, um, big dairy doesn't have to be bad. Dairy doesn't have to be bad, right? Um, how can we act as agents of change within the system so that consumers feel confident that the dairy that they're buying is um, checking all the boxes as it relates to climate change and quality of life for both the animals and the farmers, et cetera. The other one is along the lines of what Amber mentioned, and that's on-farm implementation. Um, so one of the ways we've brought this forward is through partnerships. Partnerships are so critically important anymore. You can't get anything done, uh, or rather you cannot get the types of scale done that you need without going for multiple partnerships, sometimes all under one umbrella. So a recent example for us would be in New York um, through our partnership with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and some other dairy uh, co-ops there, we've received an RCPP grant to help pay farmers to move more towards soil uh, centric practices. And this follows a pattern that we've done in Ohio and Kansas and a conservation innovation grant that we've done with the USDA. And so you know, opening those big doors that farmers themselves cannot open, right? We as a business, we have a VP of government affairs, we have, you know, policy advocacy, um, you know, we can take a multi-state approach when it comes to the funds that NRCS is sending versus an individual farmer who can only open the NRCS door for themselves and their own land at a county level, right? So using that scale to make sure that the right partners are at the table, but that we're opening really big doors that could not be opened otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. There is so much there that you were just saying that I think the thread that I'm really pulling from all three of you is this, this challenge of scalability and maintaining the integrity of these regenerative goals, sustainability goals, and still being able to scale and innovate. And, you know, that's not something that's unique to the dairy industry, certainly, but I would love to hear a little bit more about how you and, and your organizations go, go about remaining competitive um, and still meeting that regenerative moment. Well, we're probably not competitive um, <laughs> because we're so niche. Um, you know, it's like we're buying from all these uh, very, you know, small farms and it is, um, you know, the products we sell are definitely um, more expensive. Um, so it's hard to, uh, yeah, it's, it is, that's a tough question to get at because that is an important 
um, aspect of it. But I would say we're, we're not necessarily, we're, we have the luxury of not trying to be too competitive because we have kind of a limited supply and a limited, you know, customer demand, but we are trying to be storytellers and kind of further, you know, the mission and get more people excited about this kind of stuff. Yeah, and I can just add that um, looking for efficiencies that don't penalize the farmer. Um, so you may be able to find an operational efficiency that removes cost from a, the cost of up machinery or something along those lines by um, having multiple farms look at their, their processes through a centralized lens. And so just because you're removing costs from the system doesn't necessarily mean that you're removing payments to the farms. And there's a distinction between those two topics. And it's very important to have resources that are looking at it from both angles on how to pass through the funding to the farms that I just mentioned and the last example, but also how to help them use the latest technologies and understanding in the dairy industry in order to um, operationally efficient, you know, uh, add the operational efficiency at their um, farms. For example, organic farms have been, many dairy organic farms were built using the lens of a double premium versus conventional and that that would always be there, right? And not necessarily around the lens of efficiency versus the conventional side of dairy, which has been built for that, you know, cost efficiency. How, what learnings could we take vice versa on both sides and, you know, make sure that um, we're removing barriers, but helping the farmers be able to pocket as much profit as possible in their operation without necessarily passing on raised prices to the consumer. Yeah, and I would say um, one way that Land O'Lakes is working on that is through two different things. Um, the first one, similar to what Tina stated in her last one, we too are also focused on partnerships. And a good example of partnerships is we have one with Hershey um, out in Pennsylvania, and it's with Hershey and the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. So Hershey's agreed to invest in farmers that supply them milk, and the Alliance has agreed to help us with that implementation as well as help us looking for grants to match some of that investment. So that partnership is focused on ensuring that um, we do on-farm practices like manure storage, repairing and buffers, um, uh, stream bank fencing, all those different kinds of uh, on-farm interventions to ensure that not only clean water is entering the Chesapeake Bay, but we also have some greenhouse gas reduction benefits to that. So we have a few of those throughout the U.S. So that's one way. And then the other way that we're doing it is we have um, a team that works on, um, prefer the, we call them the products and services team, but what they really do is work on preferred vendor, partner, vendor partnerships. So we have um, a partnership with an energy audit company, for instance, and they go on farm and our farmers get a discount because um, we do have that partnership and they can do an energy audit and then make all of the different recommendations that what could be upgraded and then what kind of ROI that will provide them. So ensuring that we're trying to work for the farmer and br bring our collective good together and our collective volume together to help farmers um, get some discounts on those types of things without having to raise the cost to consumers. So. Absolutely. And Amber, I know that that Land O'Lakes and that your role specifically is to meet some of the, the U.S. dairy industry's net zero by 2030 goals. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you are working to reach those. And, and if um, Tina and Anne, uh, if you're not specifically working toward that, you know, net zero initiative, um, what kind of sustainability goals that your company is working, working toward at this time? Um, sure, I can go ahead and kick it off. So um, the the first the first part of that that we decided is we recently launched what we call the Dairy 2025 Commitment. And this is simply to get all of our farmers introduced to sustainability. Um, we wanted to make sure that every farmer within our supply chain completes an on-farm sustainability assessment by 2025. And this is a two-pronged approach. Like I said, first, this is the very first part of understanding and getting introduced sustainability, to sustainability, and that's understanding where you're at from, a, from, a, from a, your environmental footprint. Um, and the second part of that is that at Land Lakes, we truly believe that we have to understand where we're at as a co-op to understand where we want to go. So we know we want to get to net zero, but making that first benchmark was really our stake in the ground. And then our second part of that is really developing those um, very strategic partnerships 
with some of our customers to ensure that we're helping farmers do this collectively um, because obviously we share the same scope three footprint as they do and so making sure that we're we're bringing the most value that we can to help the farmer be successful not just for a short period of time through an incentive but making sure that we're finding technologies that give them that long-term payback like i've been talking about so that's really a couple of ways that we're that we're trying to get to that 2050 goal yeah, and it sounds like, I mean, it, the farmer buy-in aspect feels like it can be one of those, one of the biggest hurdles when you're trying to convince someone who's already been struggling hand, maybe hand to mouth in, in the dairy industry for a long time, that making this one big change or a series of changes is the investment that it's going to take to bring them a little bit more stability is certainly sounds like it's very difficult across the board. Yes, I would agree. Um wholeheartedly. I mean, if you think about a farmer, they also have just so many things on their plate that sustainability seems like just overwhelming to them because they don't, they don't quite, um, it's not that they don't understand. It's just one more thing to add to their plate and to help it to help um, have the resources to help it make, make it as simple as we can as they go through the process. Yeah. And that's a great place for me to jump off of from uh, Amber actually related to helping farmers, um, have that decision-making process and help it feel informed and personalized as well. So, you know, I mentioned earlier that we have our Horizon Organic brand that has our carbon positive commitment by 2025. And so where we are not able to reduce offsets uh, or sorry, emissions to zero, we will be purchasing offsets. And we knew that at the time that we made the commitment, you know, being able to take dairy down to zero in five years is a very, uh, for the single largest uh, milk brand in the U.S. is, you know, a very daunting task. And there's a couple of ways in which we can enroll farmers uh, for that you know, beyond what I already mentioned in the financing options. And that's technical assistance. So being able to help them see what the top um, pro practices are that they can implement at the farm that helps them reduce their greenhouse gas emissions footprint, whether it be in the dairy shed actually, or even out in the field as it relates to feed, especially for our organic farmers that a lot of the feed is coming from on the farm. And so we uh, announced our partnership in 2018 with Sustainable Environmental Consultants and their Eco Practices platform. And they provide what's called a Sustainable Continuous Improvement Plan to our farms. And that uh, is part of our soil health program. So the farmers get that assistance year on year as they move through the program and adopt those practices to see what the impact is on farm and to their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we're enrolling as many farmers as we can into the cool farm tool uh, to measure what the greenhouse gas footprint is um, for dairy specifically for their operation. Um, and then um, the other one actually just slipped my mind. <laughs> so, oh, the, the return on investment tool. So helping farmers be able to enter information from their own operation that tells them as they move through the stages of this change for regenerative agriculture, especially in year three to year five, right? If you keep it up, here's what it means for your bottom line, how you move from black to red, or, um, you know, based on um, a massive amount of data available from uh, ag economists and also the USDA to help them make that decision of, okay, what happens if I plant cover crops? What happens if I have to buy a roller crimper? Um, what does this mean for me for the next decade? And then you take this out of a situation where you have to pay premiums and then the moment you take the premiums away the behavior stops to embedding it into the farmer's own why and the reason you do that is to show the farmer that whether or not they're doing business with us this is good for their bottom line and somebody has to be fighting for the system to remain stable because if it goes down it's taking all three of our businesses with it on, on the call right so stabilizing the system helping farmers find their own why, helping them teach other farmers why they're doing that is critically important to bring others through the system as multiple dairy brands look to move towards reduced greenhouse gas emissions, but also to meet our own goal of being um, carbon neutral on horizon by 2025. Um, I love, oh, I was just going to tell Tina, I love that ROI tool, Tina. We may have to connect on that afterwards. That sounds awesome. Yeah, no, it's very cool. I, I think um, I just wanted to tell um, Tina as well. I, I think that it's so cool um, that you guys are doing what you're doing with the 2025 um, branding on the side of the carton. Um, I feel like one of the biggest challenges, and I have that in my fridge right now. So I was like, I, was, I looked at that this morning. Um, but I think one of the biggest things that's facing the dairy industry right now is just like this extremely bad 
reputation. And while um, dairy does contribute to greenhouse gases, like I think 10% of greenhouse gas production in the US comes from agriculture and from that 2% comes from dairy. So it's not, I, I, but I feel like dairy gets at an outsized kind of share of the blame in the media and stuff. So something that I've been on a little soapbox about is that dairy has to get out ahead of this with marketing. And I feel like companies like Oatly or other plant-based companies have really gone after it and done a great job and dairy hasn't been doing as good of a job. So I was so excited to hear you talking about how you guys are connecting with the consumers on that level. Um, because I feel like another important message um, when it comes to carbon neutrality and kind of um, reducing greenhouse gases is just that, you know, um, dairies, especially those that are grass-based, and I know that's not realistic for, um, for all farms, um, either because of the landscape where they operate or because of the size of their operation, but grass-based dairy farming is kind of nature's original and best way to um, capture carbon and improve um, soil fertility and, and water quality and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like, you know, that's what I'm um, talking about with a lot of our um, customers and, um, and whenever I have the opportunity, basically, because um, if, if more people were doing um, grass-based dairy and kind of um, turning that, you know, waste product of manure into a resource, which it is, um, because in any regenerative system, you need animals to kind of contribute that for soil fertility. Um, that would just have a huge impact um, across the world. Yeah, and I'm so glad that you touched on, on that and the idea of you know com consumer communication. I know that Tina and Amber were talking a little bit about communicating with the farmers. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about maybe the way in which you, you all are trying to communicate with consumers um, about how dairy uh, can be a better regenerative tool, um, and and also you know in comparison with the the plant based market, which is really edging in you know not just on dairy, we're seeing it with meat as well, and and kind of how you're working to communicate with consumers that that dairy is a part of a regenerative system if we invest invest properly in it. Yeah, I can jump in there real quick. Um... With Horizon, we took the life cycle assessment from our um, entire footprint and actually made it public on our website. So in just a moment, I'll uh, share the link so folks can take a look at that. But, um, you know, creating this interactive tool and allowing consumers to see firsthand what the impact of their choices are and how we're working to mitigate any of those, um, you know, negative externalities as it relates to carbon, at least. Uh, it's important to help them understand that animals can be part of the solution. So, you know, Anne mentioned Oatly. One of the things that the, you know, some of the plant-based uh, businesses in the world are doing is villainizing, um, you know, animal-based products. And I understand why, but it is kind of an older conversation that we've been having for a while as a society. And now that we've got all of this learning on what regenerative agriculture potential is and how critically important animals can be to regenerating land. And we're doing it here on our own land with grazed animals out back. I could show you a strip across a hill where my husband took our, our um, turkeys grazing and it's dark green and the rest of the, the hill is you know, light green because it's all needing of regeneration. Animals can be critically important. We have to show consumers a different narrative than just plant-based versus animal-based. Most households, I think it's somewhere around 80%, are actually flexitarian households where they have both types of milk in the home. So, you know, people are, are looking for choice and we don't necessarily need to villainize one side of the, the market. Milk is not going to go away. What we need to make is a better milk. Definitely. Well, and the way that we communicate that, I mean, again, we are compared to Danone and, and Land Lakes, we are like not even a drop in the bucket or like <laughs> so tiny. But um, my whole mission as like a cheesemonger has been to just kind of uh, try to be a cheerleader for supporting this kind of agriculture. And um, it just so happens that making cheese is the way that, um, you know, the farms that we work with have decided to attack this question because um, there are a lot of the farms are doing it um, because they wanted a way to make a living as a small farm, but they also wanted to participate in this regenerative um, economy, um, and in in a way that goes uh, that that talks about you know uh, the land, but also kind of addresses um, what's happening to rural economies um, with the you know commodification of of farming. Um, it kind of just sucks equity out of these rural areas and consolidates it in the hands of um, processors and other big companies. So. Um, we really just try to talk about, and not in like a, you know, in like a, a too heavy handed way, 
but just talk about, hey, you're participating in this virtuous cycle by eating this cheese. It's like delicious, it makes you happy, but you know, um, you're also like really contributing on so many different levels. So we do that through you know, our blog and our newsletters. And I wrote a book last uh, fall called The New Rules of Cheese um, that was published by 10 Speed Press. So trying to spread the gospel that way too. There's one uh, little essay in the book that says, uh, eat cheese, save the planet. So I was kind of just like really hammering it home. Like, come on guys, <laughs> cows are the solution, not the problem. <laughs> Well, I love that. I love that term, the idea of this, a virtuous cycle. Um, I want to kind of, unless Amber, you have anything that you'd like to add? No, I just wanted to tell Anne that she keeps saying she's small, but that stuff you're doing like with the book and like eat cheese and cows are the solution, that's mighty. So don't, don't, dis, don't discount yourself and all the work that you're doing. Oh, thanks. Well, it's been super interesting to talk with you guys in here. Um, all the amazing things that are happening from this bigger level because it's like that's what it's going to take it's from like the big to the small everybody kind of you know thinking about ways to address these issues it's really cool yeah and I think like that's a perfect segue because in the spirit of collaboration I would love to send uh, all of us into some breakout rooms so that we have a chance to talk on a little bit of a smaller scale get to know each other for a few minutes and then maybe brainstorm some questions that we'd like to bring to the panel so that we can finish out with our Q&A and we can uh make sure that we finish up right at the top of the hour. Um, so Kate, if you wanna send into breakout rooms, I'll uh, see you guys in there. Hey, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you had a chance to connect with some people in your breakout rooms, had some, fostered some discussion. Um, it looks like we have one question in the chat that I would love to uh, bring to the speakers. If anybody else has any questions that they were talking about or ideas or anything um, in the breakout rooms, please feel free to pop it in the chat um, and we'll, we'll continue with our discussion. Um, and so if this is from Eva and she says, curious what your processes are for identifying viable regenerative farms to source from. Does the responsibility lie on the farmer to market themselves and make their qualifications known or are there other key industry players filling this role? Is that any kind of a barrier? And so um, you know, is there, how, how are you going about finding uh, supplier sources that are vetted? Are you doing the vetting yourself? Um, so I don't know if, if any one of you would like to speak to that particularly. Well, I'll go first because my situation is a little bit different. Um, so we are a hundred year old cooperative. So we're actually not looking for new farms right now because um, we have enough milk right now. Um, so what we're doing is actually on the other side where we're taking these farmers that have been cooperative members, some of them the whole time they've been dairy farmers, it's crazy how long they've been with us and, and helping them become regenerative. So it's not sourcing, like finding a new one that is already there, it's helping bring them on the journey which is actually, um, is a, it's a very um, fun and engaging and um, sometimes entertaining way to go about it. But that's what we're doing is we have to find a way to bring our farmers on the journey and that they're on all different stages of their sustainability journey. So really finding out what works with each farm because each dairy farm is different. Yeah, and then just building on that because it's similar for us with that direct contract model, we had those relationships already in place. So rather than changing supply to regenerative dairies, which may or may not ex have existed at, when we made our commitment in 2018. It's been more about how we help our existing uh, producers convert to regenerative practices. And I mentioned some of the mechanisms we're using earlier around finance and tools and technical assistance. So, you know, working with what we have and helping farmers that are already um, solid suppliers for us and already meet our quality requirements and our location and, you know, all of that. Um, you know, convert into these practices and, and hopefully get as many as we can from the middle to, to move. Not just the, the passionate ones that want to see change, but also those who are maybe, you know, looking to others to lead and then are willing to jump in when they see the example somewhere else in the system. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's so incredible. I think that's like um, 
the way that I personally envision the difference between larger producers playing this role and smaller producers is that the larger, produ larger producers making those kinds of investments, both of time and financial resources, to help the farmers that they're already working with build up. And I'd be curious, Anne, if, if you are more uh, looking to help these smaller farmers um, gain access to the market, and if you're you know, constantly searching for source, sources that and suppliers that kind of meet your sustainability goals. Yeah, um, the artisan cheese world is pretty small. Um, we're a pretty like small and tight knit community. So I feel like when new suppliers come our way, um, it's often kind of like word of mouth. You know, somebody will say, oh, have you checked out so-and-so? They're in the Berkshires and they're making amazing cultured butter or, you know, whatever the situation may be. Um, so, um, but then, you know, aside from that, we do have kind of a, a, a supplier approval, um, you know, uh, just, you know, process that we ask people about their farming practices and food safety practices and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of, it's a much more kind of grassrootsy approach that we take. Amazing. I love this question that just came into the, into the chat from Jennifer. She's saying, she's talking about how in the breakout rooms, they had a really nice conversation about this flexitarian trend that, that Tina was mentioning. Um, and the urgent need to not only address climate change, but to take a leadership position to reduce the impact at scale. And so how are each of you and your organizations increasing your transparency? And I think this is probably mostly a question for Tina and Amber, although Anne, if you have something that you'd like to add, of course, feel free. Um, but increasing transparency so that consumers can make those informed choices that you know we're, we're realizing more and more they, the consumer consciousness is at, at an all time high. Sure, so the good news is, is that we recently just had a team of very smart interns studying um, college age kids and their diets and, and how dairy fits into it. So with the flexitarian diet, um, the good news is most of them love cheese. So um, the cheese is cheese is in um, a majority of the flexitarian diet. So that, that's the good news. But as far as how we are doing transparency um, with that consumer is one, we try to, we're focusing really hard to make them feel connected to the farmer to help them understand that these people care about their animals, that they care about the land, that they are family farms. Even if they have 3000 cows, it is still a family at the core of that business, running that business. Um, and now we're getting ready to kind of revamp our um, communication strategy, which is still connected to the farmer. And I can't say too much, but it does bring that sustainability piece in there. Um, but for, for because um, dairy, dairy farmers are the core of our, uh, one of the cores of our cooperative, we really wanted to um, highlight them. And I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. Yeah. And for us, it's um, somewhat similar to what Amber mentioned, but we're, we're currently, working, we've done a lot of work behind the scenes with our farmers on integrating soil centric practices for regenerative agriculture. And now we're starting to take those steps of bringing it through to the brands. So Too Good has some um, mentions of, of soil health, for example, on their website, Horizon Organic has leaned into this. Um, we're working on other key commodities like almonds and soy that are tied to our silk brand. But I thought that the group might be really interested in just taking a peek at something and it's Hartman research. So Hartman is not predictive. Well, I mean, they can be, but they're, they're actually showing here how the organic consumer has, um, what, they've ch what their expectations are of the organic certification, how it's changed over time. And you may say, well, maybe I don't care only about organic, but why you should care is that as the organic consumer goes, so goes the rest of the market eventually. And so the non-GMO project verified movement and the um, clean label movement were ride-ons of the organic growth for consumers that maybe couldn't afford to purchase into the organic system, especially when it was less scaled than it is today. But if you notice the 2020 box, if you've uh, clicked on that link, soil health is a unifying factor across uh, better flavor, better nutrition, and better ecology. And so consumers are already telling consumer research entities like Hartman that this is something they now expect to be within the organic system. And the fact that they're understanding this and looking to make purchase decisions around it helps our brands understand what the value is in bringing this to life for consumers and goes back to that virtuous cycle I mentioned at the beginning about creating demand through consumers in order to stabilize supply. And so this is just an interesting signal, I think, for the group to understand that this knowledge is already out there for consumers. And then how do we make sure that they um, know what we're doing that feeds into this, whether it's organic or conventional, how they can make a difference through their purchase.
Yeah. And I love, I love that line that I, that you, that you sort of drew between transparency and resiliency, right? Because they, I think that more and more consumers are seeing them as going hand in hand, but also from a supply system resiliency perspective, having that transparency is going to make um, life a lot easier for, <laughs> for brands going forward. Um, so I, I have another question here from Ethan and then it, and I'd love uh, to remind everyone that if they have any questions, go ahead and pop them in the chat. Um, so what's, the, what's next for each of you in making regenerative agriculture come to life in your supply system? And, and Ethan, if you'd like to elaborate at all or add anything to that question, um, please feel free to do so. I think, um, you know, we're just, we're staying the course, you know, we've been kind of championing um, these ideas um, that have been kind of at the core of our business since we started back in 2006. Um, and I think interestingly, um, you know, COVID has provided us with a, a strange opportunity to connect with like even more people. For example, like I never would have been part of this conversation, um, you know, had it not been for the pandemic. Um, we've also had an opportunity to do a lot of virtual tastings um, some for like smaller groups, but other also others for you know bigger entities that we might not have um, talked to uh, before this either. And so, just kind of weaving that messaging into the overall like pleasure of eating cheese, because at the root of it, eating these foods like makes us happy. And so, um, kind of helping people connect the dots that way is um, just something that we want to keep doing because uh, yeah, we we believe we believe in it. Maybe I'll just add a little bit here, and I can't wait to do one of Anne's cheese tastings. You're getting claps in the chat there right now. Um, Thank but you, <laughs> um, I'm curious, we've talked a bunch in this conversation about transparency and resilience and sustainability and regeneration. And I'm just curious to sort of tease that apart a bit, maybe for Tina um, and Amber, just to like, what is it that is that is not what you've done for sustainability or resilience before, but what is sort of new in how you're approaching regeneration and and bringing that into the, the supply system for your company yeah so from our end ethan and thank you for the question it would be um adding additional elements outside of just agriculture and soil so for example regenerative policy regenerative finance and for example we have built one of the first um, regenerative finance programs that includes grant philanthropic and impact investing funds to help farmers move forward in adopting the practices that they're getting um, recommended through the technical assistance, right? So not only paying for technical assistance, which is outside of the norm, I would say in the past, um, when I was leading sustainability for four brands at Kellogg's, we did that through certifications, you know, organic, transitional, Nova Sayers, uh, who's on your team now, uh, was actually part of that team helping me bring that to life. Um, you know, non-GMO project verified organic, typically we're passing premiums through for a specific certified outcome. And as we all know uh, on this call, or there's several uh, opinion leaders on this call, certainly about the fact that regenerative has no standard of definition at the moment, um, you know, ensuring that we're uh, not just handing the farmers a to-do list and walking away, but actually handing them all of the tools that they need, as well as increasing the, or rather decreasing the time that it takes for them to see the full ROI on the practices that they're making. So can we pay 80% of something, you know, through grant philanthropic uh, means or by um, notifying the farmer of tax incentives, for example, to help with, with that change? And then if there's any left over, can we get them an impact investing loan that's coordinated to their existing debt that their banker or local banker might not be interested in because it's novel, right? And make sure that they have all of those tools. I would say those approaches are very different from typical sustainability in the past. So I think the most exciting thing for the team that I lead at Land Lakes is we worked really hard to establish this, these partnerships and now real work is being done. So you can go there and see the progress. So you can go see acres of trees being planted or new manure storage is being built or cover crops being planted in the upper Midwest. And so that's the heart of the matter, right? Like we can talk all we want. We can form all these partnerships. We can say we're going to do something, but now we're doing it. And I think that's the most exciting thing for, for my, my team and for Lando Lakes. Yeah, and I think that's very, yeah, very well said just to do it and to continue doing it. And I think in the spirit of the of regeneration and certainly 
I think how good's perspective is that uh, it's not a destination, right? It's just doing, continuing to do better and continuing to push the boundaries of what we think of as regenerative. Um, and so that truth dis disruption and, you know, revealing the path to regenerative is just that it's revealing a pathway continuously. Um, and I saw that you um, maybe wanted to add something else. Oh yeah, just something very silly. I have like this pipe dream of um, creating a shop um, in Manhattan that would be kind of like a fully immersive like experience where you could like see everything from like soil to cheese in one like location. <laughs> It'd be like the weird Disney of like, you know, uh, of sustainable agriculture and cheese. But I feel like, you know, I, and this is totally not gonna happen, but I find the soil part of it in particular so fascinating and so interesting. And I'm like the weird woman in Brooklyn who has like a worm bin in my house. And like, <laughs> I just like love it so much. And um, anyways, but I feel like kids would love it. Grownups would be fascinated by it. So I feel like anything, you know, that we could do to sh literally show consumers like what is happening on those farms that's so fascinating that is contributing to these, you know, um, bigger changes would be really cool. So if anyone wants to invest in an overpriced, you know, fully immersive tea shop in Manhattan, let me know. <laughs> I'm in. Yeah, I'm in. Sign me up. Who um, wouldn't? And I think that's just like such a, the, the consumer being wanted, they want to be connected to their food, right? People are more, and I think post COVID, I think that one positive that's come out of it is people understanding or being exposed to their food system in a way that they probably never were before. And so I love this idea of like, not just telling them about it, but bringing the farm to them, um, which I think is very cool. Um, I, uh, Tina would like to address a, a comment in the chat quickly and, and then I think we'll wrap up after that. Yeah. yeah, so just 60 seconds, maybe even less. Tim had mentioned ROC exists. So the Regenerative Organic Certification that was launched by Dr. Bronner's Patagonia and Rodale Institute. And yes, that is a lovely, wonderful North Star for the regenerative movement. And I will absolutely defend it every day of the week, but it is organic plus plus. And less than 1% of farmland in the US is organic or just at 1%. So if you go after that organic plus plus in the US, you will have missed the other 99. So how do you meet those farmers where they are as opposed to forcing them at organic? Can you get them to move uh, positively along the spectrum so that we can get the most amount of change for those farmers in the middle who disbelieve organic and think it's frou-frou, you know, hippie hugging fairy dust, whatever. Um, <laughs> How do you make it real for them that this is meaningful for them and not just a bespoke, artisanal, expensive part of the food system that can afford to do this? It has to be in the everyday. So just wanted to mention that. Thanks, Leah, for the opportunity. Sure. Yeah. And I think that that also speaks again to that idea of, of farmer buy-in and, and getting buy-in from every part of this, of this supply system, from suppliers, from producers, from procurement teams, from sourcing. And so, um, you know, with that, I would, I, I just want to say thank you so much again to our panelists. Thank you everyone for coming, um, for joining us. I hope to see you all again at our upcoming sessions, um, which you can sign up for at How Good slash Innovation Series. Um, and yeah, so I, I think we'll wrap it up there right at the top of the hour. Um, and I hope to see you all again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.